Welcome to 2023 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Lesson 3, titled The Tithing Contract, is read in preparation for teaching on Sabbath 21. Sabbath afternoon, January 14. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for each person who is listening to the podcast of the reading of the Adult Bible Study Guide for the Sabbath School Lessons this quarter. And today, as people listen by themselves or with their families or with church groups, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be present to bless each one. Whether they're listening in Toowoomba in Queensland, Australia, or Wabag and Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea, or Bogota in South America, or Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, or Massachusetts in the United States, or Lavonda and her friends in Honolulu, or Vancouver in Canada, or Vienna in Austria, or in Hong Kong in China, and Tokyo in Japan, and all those listening throughout Texas, and those listening from the great continent of Africa, particularly those today who are listening from Malawi and Kenya. Lord, I just want to thank you that we can come each day to your word and not only find new things, but also find comfort and hope and instruction and also the story of salvation. And as we study your word this week, I pray that we may be drawn closer to you than your Holy Spirit will be with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our memory text this week is Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in the this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Let's read that again, Malachi 3 and verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. In Genesis chapter 14, Abram had returned from a successful hostage rescue mission in which he had saved his nephew Lot's Lot's family and the other people taken from Sodom. The king of Sodom was so grateful for the rescue that he offered Abram all the spoils of the battle. Abram not only refused the offer, but also gave a tithe of all that he possessed to Melchizedek. Immediately after Abram's tithing experience, the Lord said in Genesis 15.1, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. In effect, the Lord was telling Abram, Don't worry, I will be your protector and provider. Then, much later, Moses told Israel as they were about to enter Canaan, You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 and 23. Ellen G. White wrote in Testimonies for the Church, volume 3, page 393, Men were required to offer to God gifts for religious purposes, before the definite system was given to Moses, even as far back as the days of Adam. End of quote. What does that mean for us today? Sunday, January 15. Tithe equals a tenth. Dictionaries define tithe as a tenth part of something, or ten percent. This definition is likely taken from the Bible narrative. Tithe is simply returning ten percent of our income or increase to God. We understand that all we have belongs to Him in the first place. 
The tithing legislation given to Israel at Mount Sinai points out that the tithe is holy and belongs to God, as you read in Leviticus 27 verses 30 and 32. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. God asks only for his 10%. Our offerings of gratitude are separate from and in addition to the tithe. The tithe is the minimum testimony of our Christian commitment. Nowhere in the Bible do we find any indication that God's portion is less than a tenth. Read Genesis 14 verses 18 to 20 and Hebrews 7 1 to 9. What was Abram's response to meeting Melchizedek? What does this teach us about how far back in history the practice goes? Genesis 14 Beginning at verse 18, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. And Hebrews 7 Beginning at verse 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now, consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils, and indeed those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them receives tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. The first mention of tithe in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 14, which tells the story of Melchizedek's meeting with Abram. The last mention of tithe in the Bible recalls the same encounter, but the words tenth and tithe are used interchangeably, as we've just read in Hebrews 7 verses 1 to 9. Note in the Hebrew story that neither Melchizedek nor Christ were of the tribe of Levi, so tithing precedes and follows the selection of the Levites. Tithing is not exclusively a Jewish custom and did not originate with the Hebrews at Sinai. Read Genesis 28 verses 13 and 14 and 20, 21 and 22. What did God promise to do for Jacob and what was Jacob's response to God? Genesis 28 Beginning at verse 13, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then... We skip to verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and keep me in his way that I am going, and give me bread to eat, and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house, and of all that you give me I will surely give a tenth to you. 
When Jacob left home, running from his angry brother, Esau, one night he had a dream of a staircase that ascended from earth to heaven. Angels were going up and down on it. And God stood at the top and promised to be with Jacob and some day bring him back home. This single young man had a real conversion experience and said, The Lord shall be my God, and of all that you give me, I will surely give you a tenth. That was from verses 21 and 22 of Genesis 28. So to finish the day, why is it important to understand that tithing, like the Sabbath, was not something that originated in the ancient Israelite legal or even religious system? What message should we, who live after the cross, take from this truth? Monday, January 16 where is the storehouse? Read Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. What can we learn from this verse about where our tithe should go? Malachi 3 verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Though specific directions are not given in the text, it is nevertheless evident that God's people knew what he meant by the word storehouse. God does include in his directions that there may be food in my house. His people understood that God's house initially was the sanctuary, the elaborate tent that was built by specific direction given to Moses at Mount Sinai. Later, when Israel lived in the Promised Land, the central location was first in Shiloh and then more permanently at the temple in Jerusalem. Read Deuteronomy 12, verses 5 to 14. What verses do not indicate that God's children could use their own discretion as to where their tithe was deposited? What principles can we take from these verses for ourselves today? Deuteronomy 12, beginning at verse 5. But you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all to which you have put your hand, you and your households in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes, for as yet you have not come to the rest and the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety, then there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offering of your hand, and all your choice offerings which you vow to the Lord. And you shall be Rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levite who is within your gates, since he has no portion nor inheritance with you. Take heed to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place which the Lord chooses, in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. As members of God's family, we want to understand and practice His will regarding what to do with our tithe. In the biblical narrative, we learn that three times each year, Passover, Pentecost and Feast of Tabernacles, as uh, recorded in Exodus 23:14 to 17 God's people were to travel to Jerusalem to bring their tithes and offerings personally and to praise and to worship God. 
Let's read that, Exodus 23, beginning at verse 14. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded you, at the time appointed, in the month of Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest the first fruits of your labours, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labours from the field. Three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord God. Then the Levites distributed the tithe to their brethren all over the land of Israel, as you read in Second Chronicles chapter 3, Chapter 31, verses 11 and 21. Now Hezekiah commanded them to prepare rooms in the house of the Lord, and they prepared them. Then they faithfully brought in the offerings, the tithes, and the dedicated things. Conaniah the Levite had charge of them, and Shimei his brother was the next. Jehiel, Azaziah, Nathath, Azahiel, Jeremoth, Jozebad, Eliel, Issachiah, Metha, and Beniah were overseers over the hand of Conaniah and Shimei his brother, at the commandment of Hezekiah the king and Azariah the ruler of the house of God. Koreh, the son of Imna, the Levite, the keeper of the east gate, was over the free will offerings to God to distribute the offerings of the Lord and the most holy things, and under him were Eden, Minanim, Jeshua, Shemaiah, Amariah, and Shechaniah, his faithful assistants in the cities of the priests, to distribute allotments to their brethren by divisions to the great as well as the small. Besides those males from three years old and up who were written in the genealogy, they distributed to everyone who entered the house of the Lord his daily portion for the work of his service by his division, and to the priests who were written in the genealogy according to their father's house, and to the Levites from twenty years old and up according to their work by their divisions, and to all who were written in the genealogy." Their little ones and their wives, their sons and daughters, the whole company of them, for in their faithfulness they sanctified themselves in holiness. Also for the sons of Aaron the priest, who were in the fields of the common lands of their cities, in every single city, there were men who were designated by name to distribute portions to all the males among the priests, and to all who were listed by genealogies among the Levites. Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and true before the Lord his God. And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and in the commandments, to seek his God, he did it with all his heart. So he prospered. And Nehemiah 12 verses 44 to 47, and at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse for the offerings, the first fruits, and the tithes, to gather into them from the fields of the cities the portions specified by the law for the priests and Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and Levites who ministered. Both the singers and the gatekeepers kept the charge of their God and the charge of the purification, according to the command of David and Solomon his son. For in the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chiefs of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. In the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah, all Israel gave the portions for the singers and the gatekeepers a portion for each day. They also consecrated holy things for the Levites, and the Levites consecrated them for the children of Aaron. And finally, Nehemiah 13, verses 8 to 14. And it grieved me bitterly, therefore I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms, and I brought back into them the articles of the house of God, with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them, for each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. So I contended with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered 
them together and set them in their place. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. And I appointed as treasures over the storehouse Shemaliah the priest and Zadok the scribe, and of the Levites Padiah, and next to them was Hanan the son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, for they were considered faithful, and their task was to distribute to their brethren. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and its services. In harmony with this biblical central storehouse principle, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has designated the local conferences, missions and unions of churches as storehouses on behalf of the World Church and from which the ministry is paid. For the convenience of church members, tithes and offerings are brought to the local church as part of the worship experience, though some use online giving. The local treasurers then forward the tithe to the conference storehouse. This system of tithe management, outlined and ordained by God, has enabled the Seventh-day Adventist Church to have a worldwide and growing impact in the world. And so to finish today... Imagine if everyone decided to give their tithe to whomever they wanted to at the expense of the Adventist Church itself. What would happen to our church? Why is that practice then such a bad idea and contrary to the Scriptures? Tuesday, January 17. The Purpose of Tithing. Read Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, Numbers 18, verses 21 and 24. What does God propose to do with the tithe? Leviticus 27, 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And Numbers 18, verse 21, Behold, I have given the children of Israel all the tithes of Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And verse 24, For the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore I have said to them, Among the children of Israel they shall have no no inheritance. Because God is the owner of everything, as you read in Psalm 21 verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein, he obviously doesn't need the money. But because the tithe is his, he tells us what to do with it, and that is to use his tithe for the support of the gospel ministry. And therefore, the needs of the ministers are taken care of with God's tithe. The tribe of Levi, the ministerial force in the Old Testament, was not given large properties, as were the rest of the tribes. Levi was given certain cities, including the cities of refuge, with enough land around them for personal gardens. They were supported by the tithes of the others, and they themselves also tithed their income. Read Acts chapter 20, verse 35. What's the message here, and how does this relate to the question of tithe? Acts 20, verse 35. I have shown you in every way, by labouring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Tithing is important because it helps us establish a relationship of trust with God. To take one-tenth of your income and give it away, though technically it belongs to God anyway, truly is an act of faith, and only by exercising it will your faith grow. Think, for instance, about the end times too, when those who are faithful cannot buy or sell, as depicted in Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 14, as we'll see in Lesson 11. 
to have developed a trust in God and in his providences and power and love will be of paramount importance when it seems as if all the world is against us. Faithful tithing can surely help develop that trust. Even before then, how crucial for all of us to have learned to trust God regardless of our situation. A second big reason for financial faithfulness is to access the promised tangible blessings of God. As part of the tithing contract, God has promised blessings that are so large that we won't have room enough to receive them. With our surplus, we can help others and help to support the work of God with our offerings. And so to finish the day, in what ways have you experienced the great truth that it is indeed, as it says in Acts 20 verse 35, more blessed to give than to receive? Wednesday, January 18. Tithing on the gross or the net income. We calculate our tithe on our income. If we are paid by the hour or by a salary, and we pay on our increase or profit if we are self-employed and have our own business. In many countries, the government takes out taxes from the workers' pay to cover the cost of services done for the people, such as security, roads and bridges, unemployment benefits and so on. The question of gross or net primarily involves whether we return tithe on our income before or after such taxes are taken out. Those who are self-employed can legitimately deduct the cost of doing business in order to determine their actual profit before their personal taxes are deducted. Studies of memberships' giving habits reveal that the majority of Seventh-day Adventists tithe on the gross income, that is, before taxes are taken out. In fact, according to the Tithing Principles and Guidelines published by the General Conference in 1990, Tithe should be computed on the gross amount of a wage or salary earner's income before legally required or other employee authorised deductions. This includes federal and state income taxes which provide for services and other benefits of responsible citizenship. Contributions to Social Security may be subtracted, as we see in Guidelines 111-F, and that's from page 22 of Tithing Principles and Guidelines published by the General Conference. Read 1 Kings 17, verses 9-16. to 16. What was the widow's situation before Elijah came to her? What did the prophet ask her to do before taking care of herself and her son? And what can we learn from this account about the question at hand? 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning at verse 9. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please, bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. 
The widow of Zarephath was told by God that a man of God was coming to see her, as we read in verse 9. When Elijah arrived, she explained her dire circumstances. Elijah first asked for a drink of water and then added, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. We read that in verses 13 and 14. Was this selfishness on his part, or was he simply testing her faith? In fact, allowing her to exercise her faith? The answer should be obvious. As we've been told in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 469, everyone is to be his own assessor and is left to give as he purposes in his heart. And so to finish today, how do you explain to someone who has never given tithe the blessings that come from giving it? What are those blessings? And how does returning tithe strengthen your faith? Thursday, January 19 an honest or faithful tithe. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. As children of God and stewards of His blessings, what kind of people are we asked to be? 1 Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 1. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. So, what does it mean to be faithful with our tithe? This week we have reviewed several of the constituent elements of the tithe. One, the amount, which is a tenth or ten percent of our income or increase. Two, taken to the storehouse, the place from which the gospel ministers are paid. Three, honouring God with the first part of our income. Four, used for the right purpose the support of the ministry. It is our responsibility as church members to uphold the first three items. It is the responsibility of the storehouse managers to make sure that the tithe funds are used properly. And unlike our offerings, the tithe is not discretionary on our part. The tenth and the storehouse are both part of our responsibility. We don't set the parameters. God does. If I don't return a full 10% of my increase, I'm not really tithing. And if I don't bring that 10% to the storehouse, I'm not really tithing either. Read Matthew 25 verses 19 to 21. When are we called upon to give an account of our management of God's funds? What is said to those who have been financially faithful? Matthew 25 beginning at verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of their servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. We read in the book Education, page 138, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, Malachi 3.10, is God's command. No appeal is made to gratitude or to generosity. This is a matter of simple honesty. The tithe is the Lord's, and he bids us return to him that which is his own. End of quote. Managing for God is a unique privilege and a responsibility as well. He blesses and sustains us and asks for only a tenth, and then he uses his tithe to provide for those in the ministry, as he did for the tribe of Levi during the time of ancient Israel. And so to finish today, 
Some argue that they don't like how their tithe money is used and hence either don't tithe or send their money somewhere else. Yet where did God say, bring the tithe to the storehouse, but only if you are sure that the storehouse is using it right? Friday, January 20. From Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 474, we read, If all the tithes of our people flowed into the treasury of the Lord as they should, such blessings would be received that gifts and offerings for sacred purposes would be multiplied tenfold, and thus the channel between God and man would be kept open. End of quote. This is an amazing statement. If we all were faithful tithers, God would bless us with funds to increase our offerings 1,000%. And from the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, December 17, 1901, in the third chapter of Malachi is found the contract God has made with man. Here the Lord specifies the part he will act in bestowing his great gifts on those who will make a faithful return to him in tithes and offerings. End of quote. And from Testimonies to the Church, volume 6, page 384. All should remember that God's claims upon us underlie every other claim. He gives to us bountifully, and the contract which he has made with man is that a tenth of his possessions shall be returned to God. The Lord graciously entrusts to his stewards his treasures, but of the tenth, he says, this is mine. Just in proportion as God has given his property to man, so man is to return to God a faithful tithe of all his substance. This distinct arrangement was made by Jesus Christ himself. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, dwell more on this idea that the practice of tithing did not originate in ancient Israel. How does this fact help us understand the perpetuity of this obligation on our part before God? Two, in class, discuss the question posed at the end of Monday's study. Think of what would happen if people decided to send their tithe somewhere else. What would happen to our church? Would we even have a church? What's wrong with the attitude that says, well, my tithe is so small in contrast to everything else, it doesn't matter? What if everyone thought like that? And three, share with others what you have learned and experienced from giving tithe. What can you teach others about the practice? And now it's time for our mission story for this week, read by my niece Sibylla, who, like me, is also a volunteer. Thank you, Sibylla. Sabbath Test in Malawi by Sharon Nalovu. A college in Malawi created consternation among Seventh-day Adventist students by scheduling final exams on the Seventh-day Sabbath. Lucy was distressed. She and other Adventist students at the state-owned Karonga Teachers Training College had received scholarships to become teachers, but now their future seemed uncertain. The Adventist students gathered to discuss their dilemma. The year was 2006. Malawi was facing a food shortage that had prompted the cash-strapped government to ask state colleges to reduce the number of days that students were on campus. As a result, Lucy's college had moved up final exams previously scheduled for Monday and Tuesday to Saturday. The Adventists decided to ask the college to reconsider the day of the exams, and several went to the director's office. Their appeal was rejected. Worsening matters, other students began to mock them over their beliefs. Lucy watched in dismay as classmate after classmate bowed to the pressure and agreed to take the exams on Sabbath but she and three others stood firm. They would honour the Lord of the Sabbath. 
They prayed and went to the director's office to appeal for a second time. At the office, Lucy felt shamed and insulted. She was reminded that she was privileged to have a state scholarship and told to study for the sake of her children, whom she was raising after her husband's recent death. The humiliation did not change Lucy's mind. She believed God would help. The second appeal was rejected. Lucy and her three classmates kept on praying, and they asked the district pastor to pray. The pastor spoke with the president of the Adventist Church, Malawi, who, in turn, asked state authorities to intercede. Adventists faced Sabbath exams across Malawi. Abruptly, the college rescinded its decision and returned the exams to their old schedule. The sudden change showed confusion on campus, but all the students and faculty knew one thing. The prayers of four faithful Adventists had been answered in a powerful way. God intervened, said Lucy Nirenda, who passed the exams and became a teacher. He has promised that he will never forsake his own. Lucy loves to claim God's promises in Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful. And here is a disclaimer. Contents of these lessons are not intended to be financial advice, but is general commentary based on biblical principles. The reader is encouraged to seek competent professional advice which will suit their particular personal situation.